Stay tuned after the show for a message from Chevron. Seasonal forecasts predicted the tropics would be busy, but it's definitely been a 2020 kind of a hurricane season. There were 22 $1 billion disasters in the U.S. in 2020. That was a record. The San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge remains shrouded in smoke. Smoke and ash from wildfires mixed with the cool Pacific Ocean air to produce an otherworldly effect. Those events combined for $95 billion of damage. Last summer's Cameron Peak Fire, East Troublesome Fire, and Pine Gulch Fire are the three largest ever recorded. The storm shred entire buildings in a few seconds. We're talking about floods, we're talking about droughts, we're talking about wildfires, we're talking about... Here we go again. It was six weeks ago we stood on this exact balcony as Laura tore through this area. Tonight, it's Delta. Lots and lots of hurricanes, a record number of hurricanes. So knowing that, um, how is uh, 2021 looking? Well, it's looking maybe better, but maybe worse. We've already had uh, quite a few events. If you count the Texas freeze, that was a couple billion dollars worth of damage right there. So we're already off to the races. Forecasters are predicting another busy year with an early start. The first named storm is expected to hit near Bermuda in the next few days. We're looking at an above average hurricane season, most likely. We're also looking at potentially a disastrous wildfire season. The latest drought conditions are preparing us for what could be another bad wildfire season. We're in such drought and have been for such a long period of time that that heat is just making everything hotter and is making it more prone to fire. So we're looking at a potentially devastating wildfire season this year as well. This isn't going to stop anytime soon. So communities really need to think about do they want to continue to rebuild and be in the crosshairs for these types of disasters? Even with the things that we build, a lot of the engineers and a lot of the city governments, state governments that are commissioning these projects aren't even thinking about how will these investments stand up to a future climate. You don't want to build to the fat tail, low probability, but high risk event if you're a politician because that will cost money, but then you're always wishing you had it when you need it. This is Politico Energy. I'm Carlos Prieto in for Anthony Adragna. And today, Politico Zach Coleman on President Biden's preparations ahead of this year's natural disasters. It's Wednesday, May 26th. Biden has really ramped things up in in a lot of fronts when it comes to climate change. I mean, on climate diplomacy, green energies, driving the new electric F-150. Is that energy also shaping his administration's preparation for all these disasters? So there's actually been quite little said about how President Biden would approach climate resilience and preparing for these disasters. I think we're starting to see it. On Monday, his administration rolled out a new plan to double the funding for a program that basically gives communities grants to prepare for natural disasters before they happen. And that is a pretty big deal. We're looking at increasing a program from $500 million to $1 billion. And, you know, in the face of that $95 billion of damage just from 22 events, like that doesn't seem like a lot. But there's studies that show a dollar of preparation saves you $6 in recovery costs. But, you know, there has been some good reporting on how the Biden team has really not staffed up on climate resilience. They say they take it seriously. Uh, we're starting to see them plant some of those seeds. Right. And in fairness, it's, it, this is not really just about the federal government. It takes a lot of cooperation with state and local governments who are usually the first responders, if I understand correctly, how um, disaster response goes. Right. And that's the thing. Like Everybody wants FEMA to come in and FEMA to do this, this, and that. FEMA does play an enormous role. What FEMA wants to do, though, is not have to be there as post-disaster recovery. They want communities to have the tools to make sure that they're not in that situation in the end, because it does cost more to clean up. So, you know, the, the communities themselves are pretty well versed in how to adapt and adjust. So there's there's an interest in giving them more information 
to become more prepared. We're talking about a drier West Coast, an above average hurricane season. I know this is kind of impossible for you to answer, but is is this just what we're in for from here on out? What we see is a trend line. We can't say that every single successive year will be worse than the last, but we definitely see a trend line. You look at some of these billion dollar disasters every year. I mean, they've accounted for $1.9 trillion of damages ever since Noah has started tracking them. And those big peak years have come in the last 20 years. And a lot of that has to do with climate. A lot of it also has to go with the amount of investments that are being placed near the coasts. A lot of people have built into the wildland urban interface, which is where you will have a lot of fires. So there are decisions that governments and people are making too that are making these events more costly. We know that climate change is definitely worsening a lot of these events. And there's been a lot of new modeling. In fact, there was a study recently that came out that showed climate change worsened Hurricane Sandy to the tune of $8 billion of additional damage. So this is the kind of thing that we're going to be able to do post-mortem and see how much we've influenced a lot of these events. And it's going to be a striking tale of how much worse we've made all of this. Also, West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin is pouring cold water over the administration's plan to turbocharge the electric vehicle infrastructure. The White House is counting on big government investment to build more electric vehicle charging stations to help transition into a greener vehicle fleet. But on Tuesday, Senator Manchin suggested the private sector should play a bigger role than the government in this effort. According to Manchin, the federal government should work towards stimulating and maturing the market, but the push doesn't need to come to the $82 billion that the administration is asking for. Manchin's vote is fundamental for Democrats to pass the infrastructure bill at any level, and both the White House and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer agree that the transition to electric vehicles is going to require a boost from the government. For more news on energy and the environment, subscribe to our newsletter at politico.com slash morningenergy. If you like our show, then like it. Leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. It helps more people find the show. Some of the music in today's show came from the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. I'm Carlos Prieto in for Anthony Adragna, and we'll talk to you again tomorrow. Chevron is lowering the carbon emissions intensity of their operations, exploring renewable fuels of the future, and investing in low-carbon technologies. Because it's only human to protect the home we share. Learn more at chevron.com slash lowercarbon.